Hey everyone, welcome to the uh, Ancient Chinese Philosophy lecture video. This is um, from the second chapter of the reader. And uh, I want to first uh, mention my obligatory comment that you should be doing the readings as well as watching these videos to do well in assessments. And I want to start this particular video off with uh, um, this slide here to ask you a little bit about your prior knowledge of some of this material. Um, remember that a large part of learning is connecting what you already know, your prior knowledge, with new information. Uh, so let's reflect on some of these questions for a minute. Have you ever put a lot of effort into learning a skill, like an instrument or sport? Um, my parents, for instance, gave me piano lessons when I was young as an effort to build character. Uh, although I ended up quitting a couple years later, it taught me the basics that allowed me to continue my knowledge of classical guitar later in life. Uh, so a sport is another example, obviously, of training really hard um, um, to become better, right? This is something that many people have experience with. And related to that, have you ever wanted to improve yourself, right, to make yourself better? If so, why? Now this may seem obvious, but not everybody would agree with that. Some people would say, no, I don't really care. I just live my life. I don't care about becoming better or worse. I just, I just am who I am. Um, so improving yourself was a question that these ancient Chinese thinkers were interested in. They were also, especially Confucius, as we'll see, very much into family and social connections. Um, I'll refer a few times throughout this lecture to my experience in China. My, my ex-wife was Chinese and we took a trip there. And um, let me tell you, that Confucian family value thing is still alive and well in China. Uh, there are many um, gatherings and festivals and different sorts of parties and even just an everyday dinner usually involves a heavy um, social engagement with many others and family and friends and so forth. Um, and this is something that Confucius emphasized several thousand years ago. So one of the cool things about philosophy in general, and one of the reasons to study the past and the past beliefs, is to see the way that these ancient thinkers influenced our behavior today, for better or for worse. Um, related to family, Confucius was also very much um, into respect for your elders, respect for those who have lived through the world. Uh, and survived it, um, you know, who have survived all the terrors of life that we all know many people can go through. And he thought that just by virtue of, you know, having that age, we should be respectful um, of our elders. And of course, he also thought we should have a general respect for humanity. He, he thought that respect should extend to everyone, but in particular, we should have respect for elders and, um, and this is actually reflected in the, the greater degree of care that children culturally are sort of um, required to give to their parents in China versus, say, America, where we just shove our parents in nursing homes for the most part. Um, so, again, it's just interesting to see the way ancient theorists influence modern Chinese life and um, modern life in general. Finally, the ancient Chinese had this conception of the yin and the yang, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, um, represented by the black and white diagram that I'll talk about soon. Uh, but this is often connected with good and evil. Although it's different than good and evil, and we'll talk about later, it is similar in some ways. The idea of two competing forces, and you can't have one without the other. Um, so anyways, before we get into the next material, you might want to reflect on your answers to some of those questions. Why do you, what do you think about good and evil? What do you think about respectful, being respectful of other humans and elders and so forth? Um, so anyways, we will now move on to the historical context. So um, we're talking about some folks who existed in what is now China, but also their influence was felt in, um, and is still felt, in other parts of th Southeast Asia. So you can see on the map there the different countries that have been influenced. But in particular, what we consider China today, that's where the two thinkers we'll focus on uh, in this lecture come from. Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, um, and Confucius, obviously the founder of Confucianism. <clears throat> 
Now, something interesting was happening historically here. And there are some great podcasts out there now on history. They just give you the details of ancient Chinese and ancient Greek history. Um, can't remember the one I like offhand, but um, I think it's called History of Our World or the podcast History of Our World. Pretty concise, pretty interesting. And anyways, I'm not going to go into the details of the history, but there was an interesting trend that it was happening when Confucius was alive. And that's that um, people were starting to turn a little bit away from the spirit worship that had existed before. Um, so, you know, the, the further you go back in human society in any part of the world, the more, quote unquote, spiritual it becomes, you know, right back to animism where um, nature is said to be alive. Um, so, whereas the people of Confucius's time had long been worshiping spirits and, you know, using that to explain sickness, for example, um, Confucius wanted to refocus the attention of society on human beings on human nature, on how to make humans better. He said, we've been focusing all this time and effort on this supernatural stuff. Um, we gotta get rid of that. We gotta care mostly about humans. However, Confucius didn't reject a lot of what his, the elders of his time said. He said, the elders are right about respect and, uh, and about family. And so he incorporated those values. But in terms of the focus on spirits, Confucius was one of the first, one of the most famous anyways of the time to move away towards human nature. Now, I have to point out a very interesting difference between the ancient Eastern philosophers and the ancient Western philosophers we'll study next time, the pre-Socratics and Greeks and so forth. And that's the, the Greeks were doing the same thing. The ancient Greeks were doing, sorry, I should say a similar thing they were also turning away from worship of gods. In their case, it was like Zeus and Athena and, you know, the idea that there is this pantheon of gods controlling everything. The ancient Greeks were turning away from gods, but instead of human nature, their focus was actually the environment, the natural world around us. So that's why the ancient Greeks were sometimes seen as the first scientists, at least in spirit, because they were some of the first people in world history who said, hey guys, let's explain things based on how, what we observe right? That's science today. Let's not explain things based on what the gods may or may not have done. And going back to the Eastern philosophers, they were doing that same thing. Hey guys, let's look at things not in terms of spiritual dimensions, but let's look at them in terms of human nature. So something consistent in all philosophers is that they are challenging to the status quo in some way. Um, and that's how Confucius and these other thinkers challenge the status quo in the East. And by the way, when I say East and West, that's sort of a, um, you know, a rough divide between the West, what we call the Western world, which would include um, Europe and the United States and Mexico and Latin America and so forth, and the Eastern world, which would include China and the rest of Asia and India and so forth. Um, obviously, it's not a perfect distinction because we have uh, what we call the Middle East, for example, that is actually much more Western than Eastern in terms of its theology. So in other words, uh, Islam has more of a connection to Christianity than it does to Buddhism. Uh, Islam, for instance, is a monotheistic religion. They believe in a single powerful God, just like Christianity. Uh, Islam also, um, Islamic scholars tend to see Islam as a correction to and a continuation of previous monotheism. So anyways, my point is when I use these terms, I'm using them usely, loosely, East versus West, but I think you'll get the gist of what I'm talking about when I, when I say those terms. The other thing about Eastern philosophers that has been targeted, especially by Western philosophers, is that Eastern philosophers are a little more spiritual in the sense of the way that they draw their conclusions. But what I mean by that is they're more willing to go based on um, not direct evidence or argumentation, but sometimes based on a general feeling or a broad principle or idea. Um, and what I'm trying to express there is that, in other words, sometimes Eastern philosophers reach conclusions without providing reasons, without providing evidence. And we see this um, no more clearly than when we look at the, we'll look at the Buddha, another Eastern philosopher later in the class, who argues that this principle in Buddhism called anatta, it's a Sanskrit word meaning no self or illusory self. Uh, if you've ever studied Buddhism, you've heard this idea that we don't, that our self is a social construction, 
um, this the Buddha reached that conclusion without any argument. He just saw it in a meditation when he became enlightened. We'll talk all about this later. But then um, uh, David Hume, who we'll also talk about later, a Western philosopher, reached the same conclusion that the self is socially constructed, it's artificial, but he used arguments and premises to get there. So one of the interesting things is the meeting between cultures and how different cultural philosophies come to the same idea in different ways. Uh, and, and that's what I hope you'll see as we go through East and West. So anyways, the specific ideas we'll be looking at here in Eastern philosophy and ancient Chinese philosophy. First, we're gonna look at the Tao. And the Tao is often translated as the way. Um, it's comparable to God or a, a higher force that is less personal. I'll get into that later. Um, the, the Tao is, of course, what is connected with the metaphysical belief system. Well, not just metaphysical, but just the belief system of Taoism. Uh, the Tao is definitely a metaphysical idea, as it um, suggests the existence of some higher non-physical reality around us. Uh, and by the way, remember in the first PowerPoint, in the first chapter, I went through the difference between metaphysics, epistemology, and value theory. So as you can see on this slide, I've divided up the new, the, each idea we come to based on those categories. And this is to help you continue to understand metaphysics and value theory. So those are not new ideas there, metaphysics. It's just categorizing the ideas we're learning about. Just so want to make sure that's clear. Um, so the Tao is metaphysical. We'll also look at the yin and yang, the two forces, also a metaphysical idea, that there are these two sort of unseen but nevertheless very influential forces in the universe that we have to keep balanced, according to uh, Lao Tzu. And then the rest of it is a lot of value theory. And one of the reasons for this is that, as I said, the ancient Chinese philosophers were mostly focusing on human nature. And if you focus on human nature, you're going to try to change things, or you're going to be in the realm of value. So in other words, a lot of what Confucius was saying, and some of what Lao Tzu was saying, was about this is how things should be, right? And the shoulds and the should nots, those are the realm of values. So Wu Wei is a Chinese phrase meaning no action or non-action but it actually means action based on passive action. It actually is more akin to Martin Luther King's nonviolent resistance or Gandhi's nonviolent resistance, which we'll talk about as well. Um, that's something that several thousand years ago Lao Tzu advocated for. Chung Yung is a term uh, referring to personal balance, to becoming a better person. So remember I asked you guys the questions about, do you want to better yourself? This was Confucius's argument for the best way to better yourself and how to achieve a personal balance. Um, but for Confucius, bettering yourself was explicitly for making society better. So you only bettered yourself as a way to help the social glue um, come together more seamlessly. You weren't helping yourself just to say, you know, like many of us would say today, well, I'm bettering myself so I can become better, so I can be this famous musician, so I can be the next hit on YouTube, whatever it is. For Confucius, the process of bettering yourself was deeply connected with um, the humans around you, which leads to perhaps his core belief that is actually very influential these days, again, and that's humanism. And humanism is exactly what it sounds like. It's focusing our intelligence on human beings to make our lives better focusing on science and reason and evidence and medicine, um, things like that, rather than say, just inventing new things just for the sake of inventing them. Uh, so Confucius was a humanist and, and his humanism can also be seen in his departure from spiritual thinking, so thinking about um, that spirits control everything is what I meant by that. Uh, so Confucius was all about humans and today, um, there is a whole new branch of humanists. They've even created something called a humanist Bible, I believe, uh, who are trying to revamp this philosophy because they do not believe in contemporary religion, modern religion, but they um, nevertheless think that we need some sort of moral framework to guide us. And so humanism is a moral framework that guides us that doesn't depend on some higher power or something like that. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not making any judgment there as whether we should or should not have a higher power. I'm just saying 
that's what humanists believe, and that's what and Confucius was one of the first to um, start the ball rolling with humanism. Now, Li is more of the social part. So Li refers to ceremony and manners, and it's a much more broad term. We don't really have a translation in English that fits it directly. Um, but Li is the social balance, if you will, whereas Chung Yong is the individual balance. Okay, um, so now let's move in to get a little historical background on the thinkers themselves. So first of all, Another distinction between Eastern and Western philosophy here. Eastern philosophy is the, the, the philosophers are sometimes referred to with the term sage instead of philosopher. And the reason for that is that the Eastern philosophers are a little bit more practical. As you can see on this slide, sages are people who they, th they find it crucially important to apply what you're thinking. So in other words, the stereotype of the philosopher who just, you know, sits in the clouds just pondering or, you know, whatever, sits on the balcony just pondering, never ever doing anything, that would not be true at all for an Eastern philosopher from this persuasion because they see a direct connection between everything they're thinking and the way they're acting. Uh, you know, Confucius, for instance, would never have mistreated an elder or not been respectful to a, to a human who did not treat him with respect also. Right? He, he would never have done that. He, that's what he believed. That's how he acted. Um, and so a sage is a bit different in that sense. Now, this isn't to say that we couldn't say some Western philosophers were also sages. Uh, Socrates, when we talk about him, would certainly be a sage by that definition as he emphasized strongly the connection between our action and our belief. Um, so anyways, but Eastern philosophers are often said to um, be a little bit more focused on practical behavior. And which is why, by the way, that uh, many Eastern philosophies have actually led to different types of martial arts. Uh, Taoism is, I've had many students who have told me that they're practice, their martial arts practice, is based on Taoist principles of yin and yang and different forces in the body and so forth. Um, so there's a very practical dimension to Eastern philosophy, I think. Now, the reason I have the picture there, which I hope you Quentin Tarantino fans can recognize where it comes from, um, that's Pai Mei. The reason I have the picture is that we sort of have a stereotypical representation of a sage in our culture, and you know, I know Tarantino is trying to be fun with this movie. Um, but uh, uh, which is Kill Bill, by the way. Um, but uh, it, there is a bit of a stereotype, I think, there um, that that image of the the Eastern sage of you know someone who's in control of everything. But as with any stereotype, there's some degree of truth um, involved that that sages do have these characteristics of practice. Now, not all sages are karate masters, uh, but there is some connection, even if it is somewhat of a stereotype. So Latsu himself, um, is an extremely enigmatic figure, and there's even debate as to whether he existed or whether um, there were multiple people with that name who we take from, their, there, there's all sorts of different theories because we know so little about him. And one of the reasons is that, as we'll see, Taoism emphasizes that we're not supposed to write stuff down, that we're supposed to live our beliefs. It's not about creating a big, thick um, book, you know, arguing your point. It's about living your life. And um, as you'll see, Taoism is sort of founded on this principle of not, of living and not keeping records of things. So that's one of the things that makes it hard to figure out. Um, and this is why I have his birth around 575 before the Common Era, because some historians place it a couple hundred years earlier, some place it a couple hundred years later. Um, some say that there's some evidence that he may have communicated with Confucius, that may, they may have talked to each other. It's so long ago, it's hard to know, right? It's hard to know. But And, and there's a similar problem, by the way, with Socrates, as we'll see later. Now, this, this isn't a problem with everyone. With Confucius, we have a pretty clear understanding. He wrote more down, there's more records of him. We have a pretty clear understanding of when he lived. Uh, 
Um, same with Plato and Aristotle. We have a pretty clear understanding that those two were real people. Uh, but with Socrates and Lao Tzu, it's, it's lesser known, and there's much more historical disagreement. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean we can't learn from the people that they were presented as. It's not actually that relevant whether or not they existed to their philosophy, because their philosophy was influential either way. So this story I'm about to tell you about Lao Tzu will kind of lay the foundation of the belief system. And as you can see on the PowerPoint there, I want to be clear that there are some scholars who believe that this story was exaggerated um, and, and and sort of embellished by later Taoists who loved Tao, you know, uh, Taoism so much that they exaggerated the story. Uh, so I'll leave it up to you to determine to what degree there's truth in the story. But it's an interesting story either way. So the story is this. Lao Tzu um, even in his time, he was fairly well known within his, uh, within his city, one of the major territories in ancient China, and um, he basically had tried for much of his career to get leaders and those with influence to act upon his principles, um, up to, to accept his philosophy. And although he had some takers, there wasn't, he didn't have much success while he was alive. There weren't too many people who... Um, uh, thought that they could implement his ideas on a mass scale. You know, for example, he was arguing for peace, as we'll see later. He was arguing for what we would call today nonviolent resistance. But that's hard to do when you live in a time when there's a lot of battles and wars and fighting between nations, right? Because to use a nonviolent resistance against a warring faction, I mean, they're just going to take you out. Um, so anyways, th there were some problems, but he did get some people to ex to, to listen, but for the most part... What is written about him suggests that uh, he had some trouble. And long story short, he, he, later in his life, he decides he's going to leave the city and just kind of exile himself. Because he's, kind of, he's a little bit, he's through with humanity. He's already tried to make things better. People aren't really listening. It's not that he's mad or resentful. He's just kind of tired. You know, he's old at the end of his life. And he thinks, I'm just going to kind of go into the woods and find peace within myself, you know, find a quiet place to meditate until my body dies. And uh, he was known enough in his time that he was respected. So on his way out of the city, and this is where the story gets more interesting, he meets the city guard, and the guard, and this the story gets told in different ways here, the guard supposedly recognizes him and says, Latsu, what's going on? Where are you going? And Latsu says, well, I'll, I'll see you later. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm done. I try to change things. I did, you know, I'm out. And the guard says, whoa, whoa wait a minute. You, you're just going to leave without your legacy, you know, being passed on with just the memory. Your memory is the only thing we have that's going to get lost soon. And Latsu says, yeah, but that's, it's not about me. It's about the belief system. It's about, you know, finding peace within the Tao, as we'll talk about later. And the guy goes, well, yeah, I get that, but, you know, maybe you could just write a few things down. Uh, the guard says this. Maybe you could just write a few things down to, so we have a record of your legacy and of some of the core principles. And Lao Tzu objects and he says, you know, look, I don't want to, writing isn't, he makes all the arguments I made before. Writing is limited and it's all about the lived experience. But eventually he relents and says, okay, I understand that maybe if I wrote down some very basic brief core principles that it might have some value. But what he does is he starts the Tao Te Ching, and you can see this, um, I'll put it up on the screen here, and it's translated in different ways. It basically says, the Tao that can be spoken or told is not the true Tao. In other words, he begins his book on, the, on Taoism with all of this is bullshit. Everything you're reading is just a word. It's only there to help lead you back to experience. And this is why some people misunderstand this book. They'll read passages that seem contradictory. For example, I think there's a passage that says, focus in the space within the pot, not on the pot itself. It just seems stupid, right? Why is anybody going to reflect on the space between the pot? But it's supposed to bring your mind to a stop. Like, what's the difference between the space in between and the space outside? It's supposed to stop your mind from going down this contradictory route and bring you back to the present. It's what's sometimes called a koan. 
right? Something that doesn't have any actual literal meaning necessarily, but it's designed to make you think in a way that brings you into the present. So even though Lao Tzu says, hey, I don't want to write anything down, it's not appropriate, um, it doesn't really help, he finds a way to write something down that reminds people of the core principles, but also reminds them that don't overfocus on this book, right? This, this shouldn't matter as much as your lived experience. So a lot of people find this a very deep beauty in, in Tao, in the Taoist perspective, a very simple beauty to it. Um, it doesn't require much extra baggage like many other religions do that are much more complex, including Buddhism and Christianity and Islam. Um, so some people prefer that. But anyways, that's the story. And um, afterwards, supposedly he goes off into exile like he wanted to. And uh, the guard compiles those notes, and that becomes the Tao Te Ching, uh, which is the famous, um, like I said, the Bible of Taoism. So that's how we have Taoists. Now here's the irony. There were a couple hundred years later, there were groups of Taoists who started to argue over the original intention of, of Lao Tzu's words, right? That was explicitly what he was trying not to have happen, right? Lao Tzu did not want the words to become so important that people argued over them because the words aren't important. But that's how flawed we are as humans, that people are start fighting over the meaning um, later, even when the religion tells you not to do it. Right now, now you can see how much worse it is in religions that don't say that, where people are arguing over the meaning, which is still happening today. Um, but anyways, that's how, that's how it begins. So let's look at this idea of the Tao itself. Now, this is, like I said, it's usually translated as the way, the way of the universe, the movement of the entire universe, if you will. As you can see for Lao Tzu, this has a very metaphysical feel to it. Right? There's a force beneath all things that is controlling all things in some way that we can connect with, but we can't directly perceive. And um, George Lucas, when he created Star Wars, was very influenced by uh, not just Taoism, but a guy named Joseph Campbell, who wrote about mythology and wrote heavily about Taoism. And the idea of the... Uh, um, the dark side of the force and the light side of the force, right? That, that connects with yin and yang, as we'll see. And the idea of the force itself connects with the Tao. Um, so if you've seen Star Wars, that's a way of understanding what Taoists are saying. If you're a Jedi, you see the force everywhere and you have a way of, you know, and you have a way of connecting with it in a way that allows you to manipulate reality and so forth. Now, the Taoists don't believe that necessarily, that you can be supernatural, although some did. Um, but most Taoists just see it as a, a force around us that some people have a, are a little bit more tuned into. Um, but anyways, it's kind of like God, but it's not, because it's, it's one version of God, as you can see in the reader. It's sometimes defined as pantheism, the idea that God is within everything or all around us. The version that you likely believe in is monotheism, the idea that there is a God separated from us in the universe. So the Taoists are coming from this pantheist perspective where God is around us. In other words, God is partly in this cup, he's partly in me, in my glasses, in the air particles around me, in the water, in you. God is everywhere and everything. In other words, this universe is more or less God spreading himself out, if you will. Uh, since the Big Bang. Um, so the Tao, though, you know, although we can use words, as I have done so far, to, to try to point to it, again, the Taoists emphasize that words will never be enough to fully characterize the experience of the Tao, right? The, the Tao will always be beyond words. God will always be beyond our reach, beyond words. But it's important to understand that the fact that Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching means that he did see words as being useful. Words are useful to point us in the right direction. Words are like a ladder that bring us up to the next level where we have a deeper understanding of the Tao. And once we're there, we can kick away the ladder. Um, and in fact, there are some gurus and thinkers and drawing from the Taoist position who are actually silent. Right? They, they don't, once they reach a higher state, which Buddhists call enlightenment, we'll talk about later, 
um, they're silent. They don't talk anymore. Right? They've found the peace. They don't need words anymore. So another central aspect of the Tao is that the whole point of the Taoist belief system is to harmonize yourself with the Tao, is to become one with the godlike force around you in the universe. And the way you do that is you make peace with your life. You make peace with your experience. So Taoism involves a lot of meditation, for example. Now, I'm not going to say too much about meditation here because Buddhism also emphasizes meditation, and we're going to go into depth on it when we get to Buddhism. But I will say that Taoists also employ similar principles in um, their day-to-day -day experience. Just finding peace with the Tao, with the force around you. Um, not fighting it, not fighting the current, going along with the current. Um, so the force has to be experienced, right? And it, it has to be felt. Um, again, words do not characterize it for the Taoist. So, one other thing that uh, often comes up is that Um, sometimes when we compare God to the Tao, it's not a perfect comparison. It's a good way for us in the West, who were brought up in monotheistic religions, um, to understand, to compare it to God, but it's not quite exactly the same. So here's an example that a, this great contemporary, currently living, Chinese philosopher gives. Because you'll often hear that in the Western world, say from the Christian or Islamic tradition, and we'll talk about this later. You'll often hear that God is perfect goodness or perfect beauty, right? Um, it's, it's the perfection of goodness. And it's beyond any representation of good or evil. It's just perfect goodness or perfect beauty, right? God, it, when we talk about a problem in theology, theology is the study of God. One that you've certainly thought of before, the problem of evil. Why does God allow evil? Um, the reason that's a problem is because God is said to be perfect good, perfectly good. So if he's all good, why does he allow evil? Now, we're not going to go down that road yet. We'll get there. My point is that God is often seen in the West to be the perfect embodiment of good. However, the Tao is actually deeper than that, according to this scholar. The Tao comes before any distinctions. The Tao is prior to any experience. It has always been. So in other words, even though the Taoist believes in the Big Bang, he would believe, even Taoists who do believe in the Big Bang, would also believe that the Big Bang actually was a result of the Tao, right? The Tao had always been there, was an eternal force that then gave rise to the Big Bang and continued through the Big Bang, right? So they wouldn't see the beginning of the universe in the same way as a monotheist would, as God sparking the Big Bang and letting it go and intervening occasionally. They would see it as, the Big Bang being caused by the Tao, but also being part of the Tao. And so it's a different way of understanding it. The, it's prior to our own understanding of good and bad. It comes before any distinctions at all. Right? So what I'm trying to do here is help you get a deeper understanding of what the Tao is and how it is distinguished from the way we understand God in the Western world. Now, um, you know, another point of connection to our culture is that there's a similarity between, I've already referred to the Tao Te Ching as the Bible of Taoism. And as I already mentioned, there's arguments over the original intention of the Tao Te Ching, just as there are arguments over the original intentions of the Bible. Um, and it's been through many modifications over the years, just as the Bible has. Um, you know, for example, with the Bible, there are some books that were written for the Bible or in that tradition that were not included in the Bible. Um, and it was actually various uh, councils in the early Roman Empire that decided which books would be included. Um, but anyways, it's a similar, it's a similar thing with Taoist scholars. Um, they go through similar disagreements with each other over the intention. Uh, and it's the second most translated book in the world next to the Bible, right? So we're talking about some very influential beliefs here. Let's look at the yin and the yang. And this one's fairly obvious, 
and I'm sure, and this is one of those, you know, concepts that's permeated our culture. There even used to be this, I can't remember the line of shirts in the 80s and 90s that had this image on it. Um, the Tao, the yin and the yang image. And so what is this? It's two, what does this point to? It points to the idea that in our lives and in, you know, both individually and collectively, there are these competing forces, a dark and a light force. And you can see the different definitions. Um, the yin is more passive, feminine, dark, right, represented by the black. Um, and the yang is more active and masculine, represented by the white. Now, notice that the complementary part, notice how there is some of the yang and the yin represented by the small circle of white and black, and some of the yin and the yang. Uh, this is what suggests that these are not opposites, but complements to each other. And so Taoists in particular, they believe that we get closest to the Tao, to, to harmony in our lives in the universe, when we balance these opposing forces to the best of our ability. Um, so let's start with a um, kind of everyday experience. Let's say I'm on the freeway and I'm driving along and suddenly I notice that I'm kind of daydreaming and I'm going way too slow, right? I'm going way too slow. Too much yin, too much of the passive force. People are honking at me now. I'm, it's actually getting dangerous because I'm not balancing my speed at the level of the freeway that everyone else is going. Um, likewise, if I suddenly find myself daydreaming and going 120 in a, you know, I'm going too fast too much yang, too much of the aggressive force. So for a Taoist, we should live our lives kind of paying attention to those different forces. By the way, you can often see the yin and the yang active in a classroom discussion. You'll have people who are more yang, right? Who are more in your face about um, a topic, more passionate about something. And you'll have people who are more yin, more passive, who may not want to share their opinion, or when they do, it's more restrained. And to be a good teacher is to balance those forces. So there's some, you know, so there's not too much aggression, but there's not too much passivity either. Uh, you can see these forces at play in a conversation, right? Have you ever had the experience of just drinking coffee and talking someone's ear off, and then you realize later that you talked like half an hour and they talked five minutes in the conversation? Too much yang, right? Or vice versa, if you're more of a passive person, there might be times where you need to speak up um, and it's not the other person's fault, it's your fault for not balancing the conversation by occasionally talking and creating the balance. So anyways, there's lots of situations in everyday life where um, we see these various um, forces at play. Now, one thing I want to point out about its relation, this concept's relation to good and evil is that it's like good and evil in the sense that there are two forces that you know you can't have one without the other. In fact, you often hear um, people say that regarding uh, Christianity or Islam. They'll say, well, yeah, of course there's evil, but that's because you can't even know what good is without having evil to begin with, right? Um, that's somewhat consistent with yin and yang. The difference, though, is that I don't think there's a balance that is stri um, striven for. I don't think they're striving for a balance with good and evil, right? It's not like when you have too much good, people start saying, all right, let's start breaking people's legs. There's too much good here. We got to rebalance it out. But with yin and yang, you would do that. You wouldn't break people's legs, but you would rebalance the forces. If there's too much aggression, you would want to bring in the yin force. So I think the difference is that even though good and evil you know, it says right in the name, one's good, one's bad. Yin and yang, not one is not better than the other. There is no superiority, right? It's the female force is not better than the male force and so forth. And by the way, it's not even necessarily woman, man, because men can be feminine and that's okay. And women can be masculine and that's okay. So this distinction refers to these general differences. It doesn't have to cut down male versus female. It's about balance. So, so in other words, whereas with good and evil, there's more of a focus on finding the good and striving for the good, even if we acknowledge that evil must exist. With yin and yang, the striving isn't for one or the other, it's for a balance between them, right? It's for a balance with everything. Um, so anyways, that, that's kind of how they see the yin and the yang. Uh, 
Now, one application of the yin, and this is what uh, sort of was frustrating for Lao Tzu, the, um, the great philosopher, the great sage, when he tried to get his ideas implemented, he believed strongly in this principle that he called non-action, uh, or wu wei. Like I said, it literally translates as non-action, but it actually means action based on the yin. So it was really cool when I was with my ex-wife at um, in China, we went to a place called the Summer Palace, uh, which is an amazing, if you ever go to China, an amazing place to go. And um, in one of the temples there, she spoke, she speaks Mandarin. She told me, because she, we've obviously had discussions about this, she told me, she said, hey, look, there's the Wu Wei. And so even today, there are in, inscriptions throughout these temples of this principle of non-action written out in Chinese. Um, so, you know, this really did have this very lasting influence. Um, so, but anyway, what is non-action? It's action, but based on passive um, principles. So it's, it's again, nonviolent resistance. When Rosa Parks sits in the wrong part, wrong part of the bus, right? that is not directly saying, hey, you guys are racist, why do you have this system? That would be Yang. She's in a passive way suggesting the wrongness of the system, right? which was, of course, part of um, Martin Luther King's Montgomery bus boycott that went on for seven years. Uh, anyways, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let me give you a basic example of Wu Wei. So, and this is the reason I have the picture of the beach here. So let's say we're in Southern California. Many people enjoy the beach. Let's say you're going to your favorite beach and you find when you're there, all of a sudden, there's more and more frequently this group of teenagers, let's say high schoolers, who are drinking, being loud and disruptive. And you wouldn't mind that. It's just that they, they're not picking up their trash. They keep throwing their, their bottles on the beach and just leaving them there, leaving their trash there. Now, what would be the Yang way to respond? It would be to get in their face and say, hey, what the hell is your problem? Go pick your shit up right now. That's probably not going to end well, is it? Right? Either, I mean, either you're going to get in a brawl with a bunch of high schoolers that are going to flip you off and run away. I mean, it's, it's probably not going to go too well. What would the Yin way be? The Yin way would be simply to pick up their trash and put it in the recyclable container and uh, put the rest of the trash in the trash bin and just move on with your day. In other words, the right thing to do, according to the end principle, would be to act in a passive way to lead by example and do the right thing without directly confronting them because it shows them what the right thing to do is without you know kind of saying, hey, what's your problem? Now, I'm not saying that would necessarily work either. Right? The high school kids might laugh at you and maybe go, I mean, depending on how disruptive that, you know, how much they want to go against the grain, I mean, they might just mess with you even more. But the point is, is that that would be a yin-based action, and probably it would be better than the yang-based way if you wanted to make a change. Another yin-based way would actually be to, um, you know, talk to lo the local community and authorities about um, figuring out how to stop the problem rather than confront confronting them directly as well. So anyways, um, that's the Wu Wei. That's one just kind of abstract example of the Wu Wei. Now, in um, Confucius's time, I'm sorry, in Lao Tzu's time, not only did he recommend this on a personal level, he was recommending it on a social level, that um, this was a way, he actually lived in a time sometimes referred to as the Warring States period of ancient China. There was all these battles between different territories and there was this consistent shift of power uh, and he wanted everyone just to get along. So he thought there was some way we could stop the fighting by using the Wu Wei. Um, like I said, he didn't get much traction on that um, back then. But let's, let's look at um, some modern examples here. Now, this is a, I don't always present the free rights in these online lectures, but in this case, I'm just going to put this up because it's interesting to think about. So let's say that you have, and you know, this is something very much hands-on that is very much a part of our culture these days, and there's a lot of talk about it in the media, and that's institutional racism. Uh, and although we may disagree on the influence or, you know, 
um, the degree, it would be hard to disagree that there isn't some level of institutional racism, especially when you look at the prisons. But anyways, let's just imagine, as you can see in this free ride, that there has been an official report showing that in a particular police department there is institutional racism, let's just say. And let's say you're part of that company and you're in charge of a task force or some sort of a committee where you have people who will, you know, you're basically the boss and they'll do what you tell them and you're supposed to help the organization improve racial relations. What would you do? And would your solution be based more on a yin type principle or would it be based more on a yang type principle? So if you're Lao Tzu, you're going to find a way to use Wu Wei, aren't you? To have nonviolent action. Um, you are probably going to have some sort of interviews with the people who have been accused of racism or maybe with everyone. Um, you may even attempt to have them work together in groups, the people who have been accused or who are most likely to be responsible for the problem. Um, you may have them work with people of different races without telling them, right? That would be the yin way. Um, now, the yang way would, of course, just be to, hey, guys, we got to stop this racism. Hey, stop being racist, you idiot. Right? It would be just, I mean, maybe you wouldn't say you idiot, but it would be a more direct uh, um, uh, attempt to change things rather than, you know, organizing things a particular way or organizing a discussion and so forth. Now, what's interesting about the yin and the yang is that you can try one method until it doesn't work and then try the other one. Right? So in my case, for instance, I would probably try yang first if I was in charge of the task force. I'm sorry, I would probably try yin first. I would try to organize some sort of talks or discussions between people or meetings. And if it turned out that no one was really listening and people are rolling their eyes and they're not taking it seriously, then I'd probably get more yang. You know, I might say, hey, look, if you don't stop them, you're going to get fired. Right? That would be much more of a yang approach. So anyways, that's a good way to understand this concept is to think about what would you do in a situation like that? Now, let's look at a real world example. And I've alluded to King now a few times here. Um, so King, uh, in, in my opinion, was one of the greatest philosophers of history. He was, in fact, he was very much like Socrates in the sense that he was shaking up the worldview of the time and really challenging people to reflect on racial discrimination and differences between people. Um, and what's interesting about King is that he was actually accused of creating moral tension between people by bringing up issues of race. In other words, he said, why are you ruffling everyone's feathers? You're the one who's making it worse. You keep bringing up race. Like, so what if I'm black and you're white, you know, or whatever? Um, just let it go. You know, people made those sorts of arguments that he's inflaming and making it worse by focusing on race. King's response was, uh-uh, I'm not creating moral tension. I'm exposing it. He said, it's already beneath the surface. There is racial tension. I'm just bringing it to the light of the day, right? I'm not, it's not like it didn't exist there. I'm not creating something that doesn't exist. And so that was his response. I always think about... Um, some of you guys might be too young to remember this now, but Michael Richards, the former uh, Seinfeld star um, in the early 2000s, I want to say, used the N-word on stage. And, you know, he just went off on this terrible racist rant. You can still see the video. And uh, King would probably say, that's what I'm talking about, right? This guy who seems like a perfectly normal, nice guy throughout his life, he got challenged once by a black guy on stage and all the racism comes out, right? It's... It's, it got exposed. It was always there, he would probably say. Um, but the point is, is that, and, and also the reason I have that terrible picture there, and I'm sorry for that, uh, but I want to emphasize how bad it really was. Right? This is an example of a hanging in the 30s in the South, an actual picture where two human beings have been hanged, and there's a bunch of white people pointing and laughing, right? like they're watching a Netflix show. I mean, this is what the world King was born into. So it's understandable that you would have somebody like Malcolm X who took more of a Yang approach and said, man, we're fighting fire with fire here. Right? That make, it, It's understandable. King, though, was motivated by his belief in God that we are all unified and the same, basically the same under God, and that we all deserve equal rights and equality. 
Um, and he was also motivated by this idea of nonviolent resistance. So um, he, because of those beliefs, that led him to a nonviolent path to change. And what's important with King is to see that it did work. It just took a long time. Right? Yang is sometimes an easier, clearer solution, but sometimes Yang might just be a band-aid over a problem. What King did, let's just take the example of the bus boycott. Um, you know, like you can see there, it was very slow. There was a lot of struggle. People got fired. People got hurt. His house got bombed. Ultimately, he got killed, obviously. Uh, but seven years later, the buses were desegregated, and that's what he was fighting against, the segregation of the bus system. Little small steps towards social justice is what King was after, and nonviolent resistance can sometimes be exactly that, um, what is needed to achieve that. Union strikes, those are examples of yin. If you wanted to use yang, you'd go into the boss and just say, screw you, get, you know, give me more money. But an indirect, more nonviolent way is, more passive way, is to just strike, to strike. Now, people have criticized the um, idea of Wu Wei between countries, right? So within a country where everyone's already united under the same flag, so to speak, it works a little better, civil unrest, protests, and so forth. However, between countries, it doesn't seem, you know, if Hitler's coming after you, doesn't seem like you can use nonviolent resistance there. So, anyways, I'll let you reflect upon the uses and um, misuses of Wu Wei. So, just a little brief note on Taoism today. Um, so, first of all, there's actually two terms that refer between the Chinese people use to refer Chinese scholars, I should say. They use this term to mark out the difference between. Um, Taoism as a guide to your life, you know, that may have not a deep metaphysical commitment. In other words, it's more just about your practical existence and meditation. They call that Daozhe. And then Daozhe is um, seeing it more like a religion, where the Tao is actually this really real divine force. Um, so different Taoists see it in different ways. And uh, it's complicated in China. There's a lot of different competing beliefs, and it's a huge cultural melting pot, um, especially since you know um, Mao and the communists took over. Uh, there's a lot of different beliefs, but Taoism is still very much a part of the culture, as I saw when I was there, and as is very much the case from much Chinese scholarship and literature. Okay, so let's move on to Confucius. So this period of time, more broadly speaking, um, the Warring States period was one we just talked about, but the more broad period of time is sometimes referred to as the spring and autumn period of Chinese history, and this is smack in the middle of Confucius's time. And one of the things I like about Confucius is he's one of the few philosophers who emphasized teaching. He actually saw himself and took a great pride in the fact that he saw himself this way as a teacher. Uh, he even he wrote um, uh, about teaching, and he thought that good teaching was imperative in a good society to instruct people on proper moral behavior and so forth. Um, you don't see too many other philosophers emphasize teaching that way, including today, by the way. Uh, much like Lao Tzu, he became highly influential after he died. When he was alive, he had some influence, but um, he never fight, quite found a leader who would truly listen to his ideas when he was alive. And when he died, oh man, all hell broke loose. Everyone was listening. Now, I want to point out a difference between Lao Tzu and Confucius here. So whereas Lao Tzu is, we might call him more spiritual or metaphysical, in that he suggests or posits the existence of these higher forces, um, Confucius still uses that terminology, but he doesn't mean it in a metaphysical way. So Confucius's terminology is much more related to human social development. So in other words, the Tao for Confucius was less metaphysical, less like a, you know, the force in Star Wars, and it was more like this sort of abstract harmony that happens when people come together, right? So in other words, if Confucius were to come into a um, Let's just take Christmas, you know, imagine 
your, your Christmas or imagine a Christmas um, where everybody's eating dinner and they're talking and socializing and they're happy and laughing and drinking wine and toasting each other and it's just a great party, everyone's having fun. Confucius would look at that and say, oh, we're really reaching the Tao here, right? This part, we have really connected with the Tao. But what he means is we've really have some good social harmony here between the people. So Confucius saw the Tao as a more down-to-earth term. I think it's also that, um, you know, to take a parallel, in our Western society, you sometimes hear people who are atheists still use the term God. But, the, you know, they might say God damn it or something. But they don't mean it that God exists. It's just a major word in our language that is useful, right? Or soul. They may even use a term like soul, like I felt that in my soul. But they don't actually mean they have an immaterial soul. They just mean in, inside their body, right? They, so in other words, we can use words that didn't necessarily have their original meaning. It can shift meanings. And that's what Confucius does with the Tao. He sees it as a more down-to-earth thing. So let's look at humanism. So humanism, like I mentioned before, is having a resurgence these days for people who believe in treating others well, but they don't believe in religion, in the traditional religion, and they become humanists. And the central focus of humanism that is shared by Confucius and every other humans is that we should use our intelligence to better ourselves. We should use our intelligence to better this world. Uh, so in other words, instead of having our scientists reflect upon different dimensions that may exist, you know, start talking about 11 and 12 dimensions, Confucius might say they should be focusing on nothing but cures for diseases and making human life better here, not just on how does, you know, what's way out there in the universe, is there another dimension, but mostly on let's improve life now. Um, and certainly Confucius would say, and humanists today say, we should not think at all about the next world. Right, there's a number of passages where Confucius basically says, look, maybe there's like an afterlife or a, it doesn't really matter. For Confucius, it's just not an important question as to whether or not God exists. Right? Isn't that interesting that a question that some people spend their whole lives thinking about, Confucius says, it's not that important. Let's just live our lives here and now. Right? So Confucius is a very practical philosopher in that way. He wants us just to better human life. Right? He would, uh, it's not important. Um, that we carry on tradition that isn't going to help us better our experience. Right? So the idea is that's the main source of knowledge we have. Yes, maybe there's an afterlife, Confucius would say. Maybe there's a spiritual realm. We don't know. Maybe there's some sort of reincarnation. Maybe. But what do we know is true? This world in front of us. We are definitely know that there's a human world. So Confucius says, if that's all we have, why wouldn't we improve it to the best of our ability? We're smart humans. We can figure all this crazy shit out and write these incredibly complex arguments about God and spirits. Why can't we figure out how to better our intelligence, sorry, better our world and better human life? So he actually has a great quote that emphasizes this where he says, um, if you do not know life, how should you know death? Um, in other words, why are we worrying about what comes next if we haven't figured this life out yet? We do not know much about this life. Why are we worrying about when we die what comes next? Right, let's figure it out now. So humanism takes our eyes and focus away from the pie in the sky and on to the practical reality on the ground. So there's a few ways Confucius emphasized how we become more humanistic, how we learn to care more about people. And sometimes this is uh, under a category known as virtue ethics. So I just want to highlight that for a minute. You've, you've certainly, I'm sure, heard terms like virtues and vices. Virtues are positive character traits like honesty and courage. And vices are negative character traits like um, dishonesty and, f and you know and cowardice, fear. Um, so Confucius argued that we have to cultivate the right virtues over time by continually behaving in a better way. 
this is a key insight of virtue ethics that you become better by doing things over and over. I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture that my parents um, signed me up for piano lessons when I was young and part of the reason was the repetition that it develops character to continue to learn something and get gradually better and better and better. Um, this is something, by the way, I couldn't agree more, even though I was mad at the time, I couldn't agree more with my parents about and I couldn't agree more with Confucius that part of living a meaningful life is learning how to slowly and deeply cultivate a skill. So I, I think Confucius, and this is my personal opinion by the way, that I, I personally think Confucius was really onto something here. Um, but what he argued is that becoming virtuous isn't just to improve yourself, it's to improve your um, relation to others and ultimately society. So Confucius sort of saw it as a butterfly ripple effect type of thing. Whereas each individual, you know, you have your own individual life, and as you improve yourself, you become better, and that goes into your surroundings, right? That, that now makes you have a more balanced relationship with those in your family. And if everyone in your family is doing that same thing, then this balance is extending everywhere, right? So if you can imagine every person with a sort of expanding circle of virtue, as they meet up with each other, the whole world becomes more virtuous. This is Confucius's vision, that once we become more balanced ourselves, um, it extends to our family, to our community, to our broader community, to the state, to the country, and ultimately to the world, right? So, um, for Confucius, change doesn't come from on high. It comes when we have moral code from within each individual and we work together to produce a better society. Very different way of looking at things. Um, now, it's important to note that Confucius emphasized that he didn't think it would ever be perfect. right? Unlike Plato, the philosopher Plato, who actually writes about an ideal society, Confucius did not believe that. He thought that things would just be better if we tried. He said, look, if we try, we're all flawed. Humans will always have, there will always be some vice, and um, but we can improve. We can make things better. And for him, that was good enough, just to improve society. So um, in terms of what does it mean to balance yourself? What does he mean by that? Well, if, if you read through the Analects, which is kind of his, you know, sort of the Bible of Confucianism, um, he has a lot of advice there for, for how we balance ourselves. But, you know, some examples would just be um, uh, in our eating behaviors. You know, you don't want to have pie every night, but you don't want to never have pie either. You know, you want to sort of balance that out. Um, you want to be confident about what you've learned, but you don't want to be overconfident. You want to still, uh, you know, be able to ask questions and to be open-minded. And so balance in these behaviors is what Confucius is talking about. And I believe in the reading, I give the difference between what Confucius calls the superior man and the inferior man, uh, which shows one who's balanced himself versus one who is not. Um, but anyways, the, the essence is that Confucius thinks when we balance ourselves and we become virtuous and good people, there's an expanding effect on the universe that will just make things better. Not perfect, just better. So related to that is the ceremony part. And like I said, um, in my trip to China, I saw this alive and well today. There's very much of a love of and focus on uh, respect for ceremony that continues in China. And Confucius definitely emphasizes this. And like I said, um, the Li, the Chinese word I'm using here, it, it, I, I'm, I'm using, I have ceremony up there, but like I said, it's actually a broader definition and it refers to manners and ceremony. So if you're following the Li, that means basically that you're just always being respectful. You're, you're opening the door for your elders and for other people. You're saying, hello, how are you doing? You're saying please and thank you. Um, you know, you're respecting your elders because they're elders. You love your family, you love your mother. Uh, you know, you're gonna take care of your parents when they get old and can't take care of themselves anymore. All these things mean you're following the Lee. Now, some of you might think, well, but isn't it a little bit superficial to always have good manners, right? Couldn't somebody just say, hey, how are you doing? Right, when you talk to the cashier at Target, she says, hey, what, you know, how's it going? She's just saying what she's been trained to say. She doesn't care, right? You might, you might argue against Confucius here. But Confucius would say, yeah, but it's about sincerity behind it. it it's, it's about the intention. 
it, it's not just about the good manner. So a person who is truly balancing themselves and truly following the Tao would have a good intention. In other words, they would ask you and they would actually be willing to listen. Hey, how are you doing? And you say, oh, you know, I'm kind of struggling with this. They would really listen and have a conversation with you because they really care. So it's not good manners just for the sake of it. It's good manners because you really mean it and because you care and want to make things better. Now, Confucius took some criticism, too, because he was so focused on custom and tradition that he sometimes threw away other values that people thought were more important. So, for example, um, you can see in this quote here from the Analects, and basically the context here is they had a ceremony that involved animal sacrifice of a sheep. And, you know, Confucius is all about ceremony, bringing people together. And there was one of his students who said, well, Confucius, do we really have to keep this particular ceremony? Because we're just killing an animal for no reason, and we don't really believe in human sac or, or animal sacrifice anymore. And um, Confucius' response was what you see there. He said, you are concerned with the sheep, I with the custom. In other words, the custom must go on because it's that important to bring people together. It's that important to um, keep the social harmony together. And the sheep's life is irrelevant to that. The sheep's life is not as important as the harmony of keeping people together. Right? So that shows you the, the deep emphasis that Confucius had on keeping people together, on the social glue, on ceremony. So what about Confucianism today? Well, like I said, it's, I want to emphasize that China is a melting pot of ideas and um, it is very hard to pin down you know, some sort of single guiding philosophy. But there's no question that Confucian philosophy has been incorporated into Chinese society. Uh, and in fact, I went when I was in China to a temple of Confucius, which was amazing. Uh, the statue picture of Confucius at the beginning was actually a picture I took at this temple. And in this temple, they had a number of historical um, sources written uh, by Chinese historians and scholars. And um, they pointed out that, in particular, Confucius had emphasized that the government, although they should not get involved in sort of a top-down control of the people, that the government should set the moral standard for the people. And they should be, in other words, the government should be virtuous and good, and so the people can be good as well. Now, people might question whether some parts of the Chinese government are good, especially with the um, Chinese president recently, basically recently declaring himself president for life. Um, that doesn't mean that this value isn't still part of the culture, right? It, even if some in the government arguably cannot act upon it. Um, but the idea is that Confucius created this idea, and it is very much still a, a component of the Chinese government, that they should guide the moral standard of the people. Um, and there are what's what's interesting too is that um, going back to the sort of melting pot nature of China uh, in terms of ideas. What's interesting is that um, some have argued that Chinese are more apathetic people in general. Now, of course, this is a broad generalization, and every person is different. Um, but as a people, as a cultural, as a culture, there have been many critics who have noticed some sense of apathy. Um, you know, for example, there's a few cases of people just ignoring death or suffering around them. You know, someone gets hit by a car and everyone walks by. Uh, so what's interesting here is that some argue the reason for this apathy is that communism has overtaken uh, more of a focus on, uh, overtaken Confucius's focus on human interaction and respect. Um, so I just point this out to emphasize again how many philosophies are interacting in modern China. But Confucianism and Taoism are certainly uh, a hefty dose of that interaction. One last thing I want to mention about Confucius, and it would be unfair for me not to mention it, especially with all the calls for um, gender equality, rightly so, in my opinion, um, and that's that Confucius was a bit sexist. He's a bit sexist. Much like some of the writers of the Bible, 
and the Quran and um, Aristotle and uh, many other thinkers throughout our history. There's a lot of sexism in our history. And one of the reasons for that is that most of the societies that existed in human history were patriarchal, not matriarchal, meaning that they were male dominated. Um, so, you know, we can blame Confucius for the sexism to some degree. Uh, but at the same time, it was a very, very different time, and probably a vast majority of men would have been sexist also. Um, you know, we, we even find sexism in people we otherwise support, such as Gandhi. There's some interesting examples of sexism in Gandhi's life. Um, I believe even a case of violence against women from Gandhi. And so my point here is that we should target the sexism of uh, Confucius, as I'm doing here, um, and let me just let me emphasize his sexism. He, what, what he believed was that because he believed that we should have this sort of social glue where everyone has their place and we have this perfectly functioning society, notice what that means. Everyone has their place. That means the woman's place is in the household next to the man to support the man, and the man's place is in the city and in the government and so forth. Right. So he had a very traditional sense of woman at home, man achieves which again would have been very commonly shared by not just him and those in his culture, but people all around the world because most cultures were patriarchal. Uh, so that's where his sexism came in, is that he thought people had particular social roles and they should not change in order to keep the social glue going. But what I, what I would argue to you is that we should target his sexism and point it out and point out the, the flaw and perhaps give him a little bit of blame for it, perhaps. But we should also realize that we can extract the rest of his philosophy from that, and as many currently living humanists have done, we can take the best parts of his philosophy and still study it and learn from it. Um, so anyways, okay, so I think I'm going to end my lecture there.